From a collection of unmitigated pedantry, the blog of history professor Brett Devereux. Teaching Paradox, Crusader Kings 3, Part 1. Making it personal. This is the first part in a four-part series examining the historical assumptions of Crusader Kings 3, a historical grand strategy game by Paradox Interactive set during the Middle Ages and covering Europe, North Africa, and both West and Central Asia. This is also the continuation of a larger series on Paradox's historical grand strategy games, where we have already discussed Europa Universalis IV and Victoria II. This first part is going to focus on the way that Crusader Kings understands rule and rulers. This in particular is a fascinating place to start because, unlike all of the other Paradox grand strategy titles, Crusader Kings 3 doesn't actually feature any states in the narrow sense of the word. None of these rulers have a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. This is an enormous difference between CK3 and its sibling games, and well worth diving into. I should note ahead of time, for the purposes of disclosure, that I made a paid appearance at Paradox's annual convention, PDXCon, met quite a few of Paradox's developers, and so have something of a formal relationship with the folks that work on this title. I also did not yet have the Friends and Foes DLC when PDXCon attendees, including me, were given Paradox's entire back catalog as conference swag. That is not to say I am going to shy away from criticism here, although most of that will be in the third part of the series. But, I thought disclosure here would be appropriate. Since these games tend to feature continuous development, it is worth noting that I am writing this as Friends and Foes has just dropped, and I have played that and all the DLC through its launch, so this discussion is going to reflect the game as it exists in September 2022. Finally, the Crusader Kings map stretches all the way through Central and Southern Asia, but my comments here will mostly be focused on the broader Mediterranean, because that is where my knowledge of the history is best, and also where I tend to choose to play in the game. But first, as always, if you like what you are reading here, please share it. If you really like it, you can support me on Patreon. And if you want updates whenever a new post appears, you can click below for email updates, or follow me on Twitter at Brett Devereaux for updates as to new posts, as well as my occasional ancient history, foreign policy, or military history musings. Image The Provinces of Spain from Crusader Kings 3 Image Description As with the EU4 post, where we also followed a playthrough in the screen grabs, we're doing that again. We're starting as this fellow, Emir Abd al-Rahman ibn Muran the Emir of Batalios in central Spain, or Al-Andalus, if you prefer. I put up a Twitter poll as to where I should play, and Iberian Muslim won overwhelmingly, so this is our fellow. I picked him in particular because he starts with the Andalusian culture, already a hybrid Bedouin-Visigoth culture, and the Mualadi branch of Islam, which in-game is more broadly tolerant of other faiths. My goal here is to resolve the Iberian struggle via the Détente struggling ending as a prelude to the creation of a single, multi-ethnic, multi-faith polity across the peninsula. That seemed like it would be more difficult and complex than simple conquest. End of image description. Unrealistic Realism in our last two series looking at Paradox Games, we discussed how the way those games approach diplomacy and conflict between states expressed a theory of history. Europa Universalis IV, in particular, I argued, adopted a neorealist international relations framework. In that game, as in much neorealist IR analysis, states function as unitary actors with consistent interests. States aim to make themselves more secure by amassing power, but since the most viable way of amassing power is by seizing territory and its resources, including people, from their neighbors, 
Everything a state does to make itself more secure makes everyone else less secure, leading to a devil-take-the-hindmost, beggar-thy-neighbor race for military power. That in turn leads to a theory of history. History is the story of states competing for power. Victoria too complicated that narrative in two ways. First, it made states less unitary, more pressured by internal actors who might want to direct resources to things other than military activity. Second, it reflected a period of history where the returns to warfare were falling, while the returns to investment were rising, meaning that by the end of the game, returns to successful warfare might be negative making peace rather than war the best strategy. Nevertheless, the game's international relations were still, fundamentally, predicted on a neorealist framework. It never quite crosses over into liberal institutionalism, sometimes termed neoliberalism, though that word has other meanings and uses, because the player is never given the option to actually set up effective international institutions. Instead, it shows how changing material realities produce changing strategies in a neo-realist framework. Or, in game terms, how tweaking balance factors can change player strategies. I want to unpack some of the assumptions that inform this neo-realist model in a bit more detail so that we can see more clearly how Crusader Kings 3 deviates from them. In its simplest form, Neorealist international relations theory treats states as both unitary, that is, they act with a single will and a single set of interests, and rational, that is, they identify their interests and pursue them strategically. Of course, more sophisticated neorealist thinkers will be quick to caveat that often neither of these things are true and the broader theory recognizes this, at least in principle. But the foundations of the theory and much of its typical application assume they are true enough and often enough to be useful frameworks. Note 1. You can actually see these assumptions expressed in phrases like Washington pursues its interest in X, which not only imply that rational, strategic approach motivated by interests but also by synecdote compresses the complex government of a large country with all of its competing interests to a single agent. Here, Washington, for the government of the United States, with three competing branches and two competing parties representing an unruly mass of a few hundred million voters. See also the reduction of the Ottoman government to the Porta. Again, I am not rubbishing neorealism as a framework. I think it has a lot of explanatory power, but we should also recognize its limits. End of note one. Moreover, neorealist theory generally assumes that states are relatively unconstrained by outside factors. Most states are sovereign in that there is no authority above them which can restrain or judge their actions, just other peer states with whom they compete. Now, when I discussed EU4, I noted that if Paradox only presented its vision of history, that history is the story of states competing in a neorealist framework of interstate anarchy, if that was all Paradox did, it would be terribly incomplete. But the neat thing about the whole collection of Paradox games is that they challenge and complicate each other. And so Crusader Kings 3 rejects both Europa Universalis' neorealist framework and its vision for history. Where that framework prefers to think of states as mostly unitary, polities in Crusader Kings are fragmented. Where it wants states to be rational, CK3 makes them personalistic. Where it sees them as unconstrained, CK3 shackles them with religious and cultural norms. The end result, to spoil my conclusion, is that Crusader Kings 3 embraces a vision of history as biography, with a particular emphasis on the cultural conditions that inform those biographies. 
So in this series, we're going to explore those differences and the different vision of history this leads to. In this post, we're going to look at the way that CK3 presents governance and leadership as fundamentally personalistic rather than either institutional or rational, and we'll look at the fragmented nature of the polities that creates. Next week, we'll look at the fragmented nature of polities in CK3, and then after that, at the way that rulers and their polities are constrained by religious and cultural norms. Image Opening Battles of Brett's Playthrough of Crusader Kings 3 Image Description in the immediate term, I'm faced with several problems as Emir Abd al-Rahman. The most obvious is that I'm not independent, but rather a vassal of the kingdom of al-Andalus. But the larger problem is generational. I have four sons and will absolutely, unavoidably, have confederate partition as my succession law when this character dies. To have a shot at gaining independence and seizing control of a kingdom, I need to avoid fractionalizing my initial core holding, and that means I have to find lands to give to the younger sons in order to preserve as many holdings, and the power they grant, to the eldest son. And that is going to mean quite a lot of fighting, as you see here. End of image description. Polities are people too. First, we need to sketch out the way that CK3 imagines a large polity. Note 2. I am going to keep using the word polity here because I do not think these are states as below. And that's actually really interesting. A polity is a broader category than state, which can include large non-state political organizations like tribes, chiefdoms, and feudal kingdoms. End of note 2. The map itself is broken into holdings, which represent a territory and its population. The population isn't simulated, but rather each holding produces a set amount of revenue and levies, along with some other minor bonuses. Each holding has a title. These are all barren tier titles, though their names vary by type and culture, held by its direct ruler. A group of holdings, anywhere from one to seven, is then grouped together into a county, which has its own title, the count tier titles. A group of counties is, anywhere from 1 to 10, then grouped into a duchy, which has its attached title. Duchies are then grouped into kingdoms, and kingdoms into empires. Now here is where things get exciting. The higher tier titles don't actually come with any land or power. Barons always hold their holding, and the count always holds the capital holding of their county, but titles higher than that do not. Instead, the game distinguishes at the ducal, royal, and imperial levels between de jure control of territory, which is very limited in its utility except as an excuse to go to war, and de facto control. The two may have little or no relation to each other, and indeed, at any point in the game, few kingdoms are likely to fully control their de jure customary borders. It is, in fact, entirely possible for a king to hold no part of his de jure customary kingdom, and yet remain a king over what lands he does hold. We'll actually come back to that notion of customary borders in the future, but right now, I just want to focus on how titles above the count tier are actually disconnected from any territorial rule. Image Map screen of Brett expanding his territory in Crusader Kings 3. Image description And so, that's what we do. You can see I am expanding here aggressively in all directions, using a mix of struggle wars and claims. The goal is to place each son in his own ducal level title. The way that partition succession works, being in a position to inherit a duchy bars that son from inheriting lands in a different duchy, the title of which is going to a different son. That in turn removes that son from the inheritance line of the counties in my core duchy, thus reducing the number of splits there. End of image description. 
Instead, the base unit of governance in Crusader Kings 3 is counts. Not counties, counts. These rulers are the lowest level that are playable and fully simulated. But because of the distinction between de facto and de jure control, it is not the county title or some abstract entity which governs, but the count who does so, and it is possible, though usually rare, to end up with counts not effectively holding baronies within their county. Note 3. Again, these instances are kept fairly rare at this level, but you can end up with leased holdings in your countries which, while technically part of your realm in practice, do not contribute levies or taxes to you. The most common example of these are church holdings in some religions, but also the bases of holy orders. End of note 3. Meanwhile, titles above the count tier don't even exist except in as much as they are held by a person. Such uncreated titles can be seen on the map but do functionally nothing unless created, which is the act of assigning them to a person. Whereas situations where counts lack control over baronies in their county are rare, situations where dukes lack control over counties in their duchy are very common. Yet more common still, kingdoms which do not control all duchies in their kingdom, and so on. As an aside, you may ask, if counts are the base unit of politics in CK3, why have barons? I think the answer here is that a fundamental part of CK3 gameplay is managing vassals. The baron tier ensures that, during normal play, the player will always have vassals to manage, even when starting as a count. We'll talk more about vassals next week. Instead, the game understands a polity, the thing you can do diplomacy with and declare war on, to consist of a person whose area of control is defined by the baronies they control directly, including the capital barony of a county which automatically comes with the county title, and their collection of de facto vassals, who may or may not be de jure vassals. Crucially, those vassals are also not vassals to a title, but to a person. A duke with two ducal titles who is deprived of one loses no vassals because they do not belong to the title, but rather to the duke. Note 4. The exception here is that rulers cannot have vassals of the same or higher tier than their own highest tier title. Consequently, if that same duke lost his last ducal title, and thus became a count, all of his count-level vassals would stop being his vassals. End of note 4. This is such an enormous, fundamental difference between the way CK3 works compared to other strategy games that I really want to spell it out again. CK3's political world consists of rulers, not of kingdoms, or lands, or countries. Image. Map of Brett's Crusader Kings 3 game following his initial conquests. Image description. After a frenzy of warfighting from 867, the game start, to 885, Emir Abd dies, leaving his core lands to his second son, Emir Muntasir. You can see here that the resulting partition radically remade my emirate. Lands on the west side of the Guadiana River ended up with different sons with their own ducal level titles, and thus independent of me. Nevertheless, I kept four counties directly in the line of secession, along with a few extra vassals. But, wait, there's more. Because only a few years after Emir Ab died in 885, the king of Al-Andalus died. And... End of image description. That in turn means that in actual gameplay, the structure of a polity is not consistent generation to generation. One could even argue that every time a ruler dies, their polity dies with them, and a new one is created for their heir or heirs. That process is most visible early in the game with partitive succession, especially confederate partition where the physical shape of a polity on the map 
can change radically upon succession, as its constituent elements break apart. The early game pictures here in my House Ali Liki playthrough actually illustrate this well. Both the radical reconfiguration of my territory for different generations of my character, but also the sudden radical reconfiguration of the whole kingdom on succession because the kingdom was never really the polity. The king was, and he died. His sons then became the new polity, polities in this case. The kingdom isn't real. Only the king is. As those of you who have read the other Teaching Paradox series can no doubt tell, this is a radical departure in design for a paradox grand strategy game. Those games were about the states, and states were the primary actors in their vision of history. But for all intents and purposes, Crusader Kings doesn't have states at all, in the sense of an institution that reaches beyond an individual and exercises a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. Instead, it has a web of individual rulers whose power is fundamentally personal in nature and whose governing institutions, including the polity itself, do not exist beyond them. Not states pursuing their interests, but individuals acting out their personalities. Image Map of Brett's playthrough of Crusader Kings 3 following the three-way split of the kingdom of Al-Andalus. Image description. The kingdom splintered into three. The way confederate partition works, not only are the deceased's current titles split between his heirs, but also any titles it was possible to create are created and then split. This is meant to simulate the breakup of things like the Carolingian state or the fragmentation of the Mongol Empire. Here, each of the three sons inherited one kingdom, Kinkir, Al-Andalus, and Al-Sark, and split the vassals between them. The mess I made with Emir Abd complicated that process, since he and his heirs held land in both Kinkir and Al-Andalus. The resulting split was a catastrophe for the new king of Kinkir, Abdallah, whereas I had been one vassal of many in a united Al-Andalus, as part of Kinkir, I am one of only three major vassals, and the other two are my brothers. We quickly depose Abdallah in the war you see here, and Emir Muntasir becomes Malik, King Muntasir, independent at last. End of image description. Personal Rule The personal nature of rule in CK3 is further driven home by the way the AI is structured. While the AI is still programmed to expand its land and titles and generally achieve some security, how it goes about doing that is heavily influenced by the character and personality of each specific character, governing both what they attempt and their likelihood of success. This isn't entirely new. EU4 has some modifications to state strategy based on ruler personality. But it is all quite abstract and the player has little influence over those systems. By contrast, CK3 doesn't have eternal polities making long-term multi-generational strategic plans. It has individuals who make choices largely according to their personalities. All of the things being equal, Characters still seek to hold or gain lands and titles, expanding their power, but what is different is that things in CK3 are almost never equal. Instead, each non-player character has an AI personality, made up of ratings in nine attributes, which not only encourage specific kinds of behaviors, but also the rate at which characters themselves act. That is, Characters with low energy and sociability will move forward their plans and actions slower, with much longer intervals between actions. They will not presumably start weekly history blogs. 
These attributes are, in turn, determined by the sum of each character's traits, which reflect the dominant elements of those characters, well, character. These traits, three per character, form during childhood in the game. If the player is either the child or their educator, they have some limited influence on this process, and then remain mostly, but not entirely, static for the rest of a character's life. Image Court Scene from Crusader Kings 3 Image Description Becoming the Malik, I get my own swanky court. I discussed the Royal Court DLC a while back, but it really is one of the best Paradox DLCs. The court functions are a great addition. We'll talk about them a bit more next week. End of image description. And the player is going to notice this almost immediately. Having a powerful vassal who was calm, just, and humble, or just lazy, be replaced by his ambitious, diligent, and brave son, knows they are in for trouble. Even though it might have been in the interest of the former to undermine the player's rule, through factions and other interactions discussed below, the AI personality they have is going to mean that they never really act on that interest, and indeed may end up taking actions, because of their personality, that strengthen the player's rule. By contrast, the son, the new vassal, is a potential terror. His traits will push him to act very often and take relatively large risks, like claiming and seizing other vassals' lands or fomenting rebellious factions. And the chunky skill benefits of those skills means he's likely to succeed at a lot of these things. More on that in a moment. That will be true, of course, not just for your vassals, but your liege and equal neighbors. It may be in the interest of your neighbors to attack you when you are weak, but if they have the content and just traits, the AI will often let the opportunity slide. Stress To which must be added one more mechanical layer. The stress system. Every character, including the player's character, has a stress statistic ranging from zero, perfectly unstressed, to 400, very stressed. So long as the character is above 100 stress, they'll suffer a mental break every five years. The higher their stress, the more severe the break, with the more negative consequences. The most common outcome of a mental break is the character adopting a coping mechanism, most of which have net negative side effects, sometimes dramatically so. And the options the player is given on the mental break get worse as the stress level increases. Even outside of these breaks, high stress lowers a character's fertility and health. Consequently, players quickly realize that stress is generally to be avoided where possible. The consequences aren't so negative to make it avoid at all costs, but negative enough to weigh decisions away from stressful options. Image Malik Muntasir's Traits from Crusader Kings 3 Image Description And our good Malik Muntasir is a good place to talk about stress. The main issue is that Muntasir, as you can see here, is content. The bowl icon there on his traits. Which means that power grabbing goes against his nature. But of course, right now, with the fragmentation of the Kingdom of Al-Andalus, is the moment for House Aliliki to seize its destiny. Doing so, however, means taking a lot of decisions, mostly wars and claim fabrications, which cause poor Muntasir a lot of stress. The player is free to imagine why he would choose to push so hard against his nature. Perhaps he remembers how hard his father pushed to land each of his sons, and noticing that he has too many sons, feels obligated to do the same. In either case, he achieves a lot seizing royal power, but the stress leads to health penalties, and Montesir dies in 894, after nine years of rule and at the age of just 39. Poor fellow. End of image description. 
Now, a number of stress sources are fairly standard life events. The death of a close family member or friend causes stress. The death of a rival or nemesis relieves it. These have mechanical purposes we'll come back to. But the main source of stress is actually not personal tragedy, but instead that a character gains stress when they act, or are forced to act, against their character traits. Just characters gain stress from breaking the laws and customs of their society, by, say, revoking titles without cause. Ambitious characters, by suppressing their ambition, by, say, granting titles. Forgiving characters by holding a grudge, executing someone who's wronged them, and vengeful characters by forgiving a grudge, releasing a character who's wronged them. Meanwhile, characters mostly lose stress through the standard elite recreational activities of the period, feasting and hunting, which in turn cost money. Beyond this, each of the coping mechanisms introduces a decision allowing the character to indulge in it, which also relieves stress, but usually at some additional cost. It is a little strange that turning to religion for stress relief is mostly expressed through negative coping mechanisms. Flagellant, contrite, inappetetic, reclusive, and improvident all open the opportunity to relieve stress through acts which were, at the time, viewed as expressions of religious devotion. Unlike feasting and hunting, which are expensive but generally positive stress relievers, there is no matching turn to God action. Perhaps. Commission prayers from the local monastery might fit the bill for an expensive but personally touching spiritual activity. Perhaps commission prayers from the local monastery might fit the bill for an expensive but personally touching spiritual activity. Feasting is also particularly valuable as an activity for rulers for reasons we'll come back to next time. Image Traits for Malik Muntasir's son, Ahanas ibn Muntasir. Image Description Muntasir's son, Ahanas ibn Muntasir, is thus thrust into power at just the age of nine. Normally, this would be a very awkward time for this, but it actually worked out for me. Expecting Muntasir to not die, I had constructed a set of alliances, mostly with al Sark and then launched an opportunistic struggle war against Al-Andalus, which could net me a lot of territory. Muntasir died midway through the war, but the alliances and the fragmented, weakened nature of Al-Andalus was enough to see me to victory. End of image description. The goal of this system overall is to get the player to inhabit each individual character in their dynasty and to encourage players to role-play, to enjoy the things this character enjoys, and dislike the things this character dislikes. The importance of the random and unexpected stressors, like the deaths of family members, is that it prevents players from carefully gaming the system, budgeting stress, to always stay below 100. In practice, most stress events cause between 30 and 60 stress so two to three stressors to produce a break. So a player that chooses to play it chill can ensure they're almost never at risk of a break except as the result of some tremendous family catastrophe. By contrast, a player can opt to be a bit high-strung and take some stress-inducing decisions for the benefits they give, but now risks unexpectedly getting pushed over the stress line by family events. The system seems calibrated so that the drains, hunting and feasting, are expensive enough to not want to be doing constantly, but also regular enough that a player who generally avoids acting against their nature, with a few exceptions here or there, can avoid mental breaks for an entire reign. But of course, that comes with some severe limits on what actions can be taken all of which reinforces the notion that a person's character defines their rule even more than the transgenerational strategies the player might be enacting. But for the whole thing to come together, we need just one more system. 
Skills. Mad Skills. While character traits influence the actions a character will take, via the AI coding for AI-controlled characters, and via the stress system for player-controlled characters. They are also a substantial determinant of a character's skills. The game gives each character a numerical skill rating in six skills. Diplomacy, Martial, Stewardship, Intrigue, Learning, and Prowess. Note 5. For those wondering how Martial and Prowess differ, the former is a character's skill at organizing and leading armies. The latter, their skill at personally fighting. End of note 5. High skills are good, low skills are bad. The impact of these skills is pervasive, as they both have constant passive effects, but also impact the success chance of various actions. Diplomacy, for instance, acts as a global opinion modifier which can be enormously helpful in dealing with a realm that has a lot of vassals. Marshall directly modifies the size of levies a character can raise, reflecting a better military organizer being able to get more men into an army, while stewardship does the same for domain taxes, the core of just about every character's revenue. The impact of these skills can be substantial. The difference between a terrible commander, skill zero, and an excellent one, skill 18, is a stunning 36% levy size and reinforcement rate, which can absolutely shift the balance of strength in a war, for instance. High intrigue, likewise, opens up opportunities for plots and underhanded scheming that simply aren't available to low intrigue characters, whose success chance would be too low, while also defending against intrigue efforts by other characters. The player has some control over skills, both in the raising of their children, and thus future characters, but also using the lifestyle system to boost one skill, or modifiers related to it at a time, which can also result, if kept long enough, in getting permanent new traits to raise that skill by virtue of long practice. Image Map of Brett's territory following Ahanas' early victories Image description. And here we have the result of Ahanas' early victory. A massive gain of territory, and importantly, much of that territory taken personally, rather than vassalized, because it was held by either the Malik of Al-Andalus, who remains independent, or by vassals who retained land in his borders. The great prize here is Cordoba, which is a very valuable holding. I promptly move my capital there, and begin planning to re-establish the royal domain there instead of in Batalias, which will in turn go to Ahanas' second son, when he has one. Which may not be for a while, because, again, he's nine. End of image description. At the same time, this dovetails with the stress system, because the traits that give broad positives to skills are, unsurprisingly, the sort of traits we associate with good leaders, being just, temperate, generous, forgiving, and so on. These traits often come both with strong positive skills, but also with built-in opinion bonuses for vassals or your liege, which are also extremely helpful, but they also tend to be the very traits which impose stress penalties for taking self-serving, power-consolidating actions, like, say, murdering your brothers out of the line of succession, or tyrannically revoking your vassal's titles in order to consolidate royal power. That said, a lot of these traits are trade-offs. A craven, paranoid, and deceitful character won't be well thought of and has severe penalties to diplomacy, but will be very good at intrigue. From my own experience, when running a large realm, which is how I tend to play. The traditionally positive traits are generally beneficial, even as they limit your freedom of action, because they help keep vassals in line. When trying to obtain a large realm, on the other hand, intrigue is often more useful than diplomacy, and an amoral schemer can get quite a bit done. Consequently, 
the whole system together, stress and skills derived from traits in education, encourages players to reevaluate their strategy in every generation, trying to find a good fit in terms of approach for the skills and predilections of the character they have. Pushing against each character's traits not only will leave them terribly stressed, but they're also not likely to be particularly good at the sort of strategies the player is directing them to employ. And the game leans into this narratively as well. I tend to focus in these discussions on mechanics, because Paradox games are broadly mechanics-driven. But the sound and visual design of CK3, from the ominous music that plays when your stress gets high, to the character interaction text that invites you to participate in your character's emotional response, all encourage players to roleplay as their character. Rulers are people too. Alright, that was a lot of game mechanics. But you may now be asking if this approach suggests a theory of history. And I think it does. Indeed, one of the oldest branches of history is what we might call history as biography. Historical narratives focused on the impact and experiences of particular individuals. In its older forms, this is sometimes expressed as the great man theory of history. That history is really just the biography of great figures, almost always elite males, who move through events through their personality and virtues. And indeed, this sort of history is one of the oldest forms. A great deal of early historical writing was intended to have a didactic, that is, teaching, purpose. To instruct elites on the sort of values and character they were supposed to have, and the vices to avoid, by using great figures as examples. Plutarch's Parallel Lives, early 2nd century AD, is perhaps the purest form of this approach, with 23 matching pairs of biographies, each focused on how the character of great men, Plutarch's subjects are all men, influenced their careers for better or for worse. Image. Coming of age screen for Ahanas. Image description. Ahanas comes of age and gets a really cool hat. By this point, I have two major problems, one pressing and the other distant, and they both relate to succession. The first problem is avoiding the fate Al-Andalus suffered before me, Confederate partition creating royal titles to break up the kingdom. In the immediate future, the good news is that all of the royal titles in Spain, yes, all of them, currently exist and are held by someone. If they exist, that means they can't be created, and that buys me time to get to the solution here, which is unlocking standard partition, which no longer creates uncreated titles. Then I can destroy royal titles as I get them, enforcing realm unity. The second problem is that Ahanas, now being an adult, is going to begin having children. And so once again, I am in a race to get and give land to his sons in order to maintain a large inheritance for the eldest. Much of the easy expansion is done now, so I turn inward, rushing the assembly innovation to get limited crown authority so that I can revoke titles from vassals, fabricating claims first to avoid tyranny. It's a sneaky system, but necessary to centralize control and enable a strong monarchy, which can in turn direct, by force if necessary, the destiny of the peninsula. In practice, one of the advantages of picking House Alialiki is that becoming the cultural head for the Andalusians was fairly easy, which let me focus innovations on the ones that unlock crown authority and succession which is precisely what I did. End of image description. Historians today tend to be very skeptical about this kind of history, because it is tremendously reductive. In its worst forms, great man history presents the individual virtue of elites as the sole cause for important events, crowding out the influence of deeper structures like culture, climate, or economics and at the same time papering over the agency 
of all of the non-elites in the story also making their own decisions and trying to direct their own lives. Indeed, a close investigation of the lives of the greatest of the great men, figures like Alexander or Chinggis Khan, reveals a whole web of causes leading to their exceptional lives. Often these figures were exceptional people, but perhaps more important, ones that arrived at the right place in the right moment a moment created by all sorts of other factors. But that doesn't mean historians have abandoned a biographical approach to history or refuse to see its value. For one, biographical history can help us understand not merely what happened historically and why, but the equally important question of what it was like to live through those events. And questions about the experience of the past are important too. Asking, how did it feel to live through X, both encourages us to develop a useful measure of empathy and common humanity, but also to think about what it would feel like for us to live through similar developments, which can often be a valuable and sobering enterprise. Historical events which may seem cool in the telling often become terrifying when one asks that important question, what was it like to live through this. And CK3 makes an effort to tackle that question, too. More than any of Paradox's games, CK3 is interested in the quotidian elements of daily life, with the additional content since launch often heavily focused on these sorts of activities. I don't want to get too far into this because Fassel's diplomacy and elite interaction is next week's topic but I do want to flag the emphasis the game puts on the actual, lived experience of these characters. Meanwhile, the idea that individuals, elite or otherwise, can shape history by their choices is hardly gone from historical thinking. Instead, modern historians tend to discuss this kind of personal contingency, where the event depends on the people involved, through the key concept of agency the control that individuals exert over their own lives and decisions. The advantage of agency as a framework over great man history is that, of course, everyone has agency. But we still grapple with the question, do you get this outcome without this person motivating it? CK3 embraces this view, as we'll see later in the series. Not merely the player character as hero ruler, but all of the other simulated elites have agency. And indeed, while not directly simulated, even the common folks can, through events, initiate their own actions, to which the player must respond. The peasantry and the burghers in CK3 are not merely clay ready to be molded, but rather have their own interests and desires. Albeit, ones that the player character, by virtue of their position as a high noble, rarely has to care about. In that sense, CK3's focus on personal rule makes it a game about historical agency. The player's plans are a product of their character's individual decision making. As we'll see next week, these elites operate with only very limited bureaucracy or institutions. So the decisions being made here are expressions of personal agency. And the player's neighbors, and indeed the members of their own kingdom, do not merely react to those choices, but initiate their own plans and have their own goals shaped not only by their interests, but also by their own needs and character. This history as biography approach, focused on the historical agency of individuals, is also really quite fitting for the period. On the one hand, this was a period where rule was very personalistic, where the temperament and decisions of individual elites mattered a lot in the absence of many institutional structures for collective decision making. At the same time, it is striking for CK3 that this kind of history as elite biography was the most common sort in the Middle Ages, 
where chroniclers tended to represent royal success as a consequence of personal virtue, or divine intervention as a result of the presence or lack of personal piety. In turn, this also produced a robust genre of mirrors for princes, like Dorda's Libra Manualis, but also including works like the Secretum Secretorum, which likely had its origins in the Muslim world in the 10th century, but was influential in Europe in the Middle Ages, which tended generally to stress the importance of personal character in a ruler's effectiveness. Note 6. Whereas, one may usefully contrast, I think, the ancient historians, who waver between favoring personal causation, Plutarch being the extreme example, and impersonal causes, Polybius perhaps occupying the opposite pole. Polybian-style histories are, I am led to understand, particularly rare in the medieval corpus of the Latin West, but more common in the Islamic world in the works of figures like Ibn Khaldun. End of note 6. An emphasis on personal rulership thus doesn't merely fit the Middle Ages as an era, but also fits the literature and culture of the period which tended to take this view. Political science, the home of international relations theories like neorealism, have been slower to embrace personalistic factors of causation, in part because much of the promise of political science as a field is the discovery of general rules of politics that are applicable across a broad array of circumstances. A large space for individual agency cuts against this very goal because it threatens to make every political event sui generis to the particular actors involved. Indeed, this is a common argument historians make in response, that the particular contingency of who can overwhelm structural factors. Of course, the world is not all of one or all of the other. Actual events are moved both by impersonal and personal causes. And so, both approaches have value in understanding why events take the course they do. Nevertheless, political scientists don't fully ignore individual agency either. And indeed, in more recent scholarship, the notion that an individual's emotional response, and thus potentially their individual character, might matter as much or more than a rational calculation of interests, has gained recognition. Robin Marquica's Emotional Choices, How the Logic of Affect Shapes Coercive Diplomacy, 2018, is particularly interesting in this context, presenting a model of emotional choice theory, where the leaders of states, rather than always rationally pursuing their interests, respond to incentives based on how those decisions make them feel, which can lead to unpredictable or difficult to understand responses. In particular, Marquica's works to understand why leaders refuse to yield to coercion by much stronger states when that was the rational response, and concludes that what is at work here is the logic of affect, whereby emotions, and the ability or inability of leaders to control them, heavily influence decision making. That in turn can lead leaders to make decisions apparently against their interest because the emotional cost of capitulating is too high. And, I will be honest, this is an emerging area of political science work I hope to see grow. Humans are not calculators, and we mostly make our decisions based on how they make us feel more than on a rational cost-benefit analysis. CK3's stress system maps so well onto Marquica's model for how leaders respond to emotional stimuli including both the impact of the emotions, but also the ability of some leaders to control that impact. That I find myself wondering if the folks over at Paradox were aware of her work. That said, while Mark Wicca's formulation is new, and particularly new in the physiological approach Mark Wicca takes to try to understand the affective effect, note 7, why, yes, I did just use both of those words right in a sentence. Truly an achievement worthy of an entry on my Twitter bio. End of note 7. Of strong emotions in decision-making is new and very exciting. 
The general idea that emotion contests with reason in political decision making is an old one. Indeed, I wouldn't be a good historian if I didn't note the long history of the idea, going back all the way to, arguably, the first historian, Thucydides and the Melian Dialogue, Book 5, Sections 84-116. to 116. In that exchange, as the Athenians prepare to attack tiny and weak Melos, they try to convince the Melians to surrender. The Athenians argue from rational self-interest, quote, a question of self-preservation, and of not resisting those who are far stronger than you, end quote. While the Melians argue from a sense of outraged justice and moral sentiment, quote, it would surely be great baseness and cowardice in us, who are still free, not to try everything that can be tried before submitting to your yoke, end quote. Note 8. Translator R. Crawley, with minor modifications. End of note 8. In the end, the Melians refused to submit, and Athens destroyed the city, effectively the worst-case outcome for everyone, both for the Melians who were killed, but also for the Melians who warned, quite rightly, that transgressing norms of violence was dangerous for the Athenians. Quote, As your fall would be a signal for the heaviest vengeance, and an example for the world to meditate on. End quote. Image Death Screen for Malik Ahanas Image Description Ahanas reigns for 54 years, effectively consolidating about half of the peninsula into the expanded kingdom of Kinkir. He also, late in life, decides to break with Baghdad and declares himself Caliph as well as Malik. That causes some religious divisions among the Muslims in Spain, but that's actually fine. Religious diversity is part of my desired in state after all. And by this point, the kingdom has Muslim subjects, both Muwaladi and Ashari, and Christian subjects, both Catholic and Mozarabitic. Though, the number of Christian rulers is few, but not zero, within the kingdom. It would be more, but the system makes it functionally impossible to diplomatically vassalize outside of your religion, even when promising religious protection. Given the role Ahanas played laying the foundation for Kinkir under House Aliliki, I begin taking it as a frequent name for eldest sons. And so, Ahanas I is followed by his son, Ahanas II. End of image description. And so, if Europa Universalis IV was a game about states, dominated by the impersonal, rational calculations states make in the name of their security, and Victoria II was a game about the impersonal impact of technology and mass movements. Crusader Kings III is, at its heart, a game about agency, and the way that history is shaped by individual decisions and individual character. Of course, just as no one truly lives as an island, so too, the rulers both great and petty in Crusader Kings III neither rule alone, nor live alone. Rather, the game is filled with relationships, both political and personal. And it is to that we will turn next. This has been a recording from a collection of unmitigated pedantry, the blog of history professor Brett Devereux, recorded by myself, A Great Divorce, for accessibility and sharing purposes. If you enjoy this content and wish to engage with it or support Brett, please check the description for links to the original post on his blog, his Twitter, and his Patreon. I highly encourage you to share, support, and engage with his works on any and all platforms if you are so inclined. If you wish to support me, please do remember to like, share, and subscribe to this or any other content here that you enjoy. Thank you so much for listening.